Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this is part three of my series on Winfield Scott Hancock. The 6th Infantry made it safely to New Orleans, then steamed up the Mississippi River to Jefferson Barracks, where it was joined by the 7th and 8th Infantry Regiments. All of the men and officers knew that their unified commands would soon disperse. As Hancock's biographer stated, everyone knew that in a very short time the regiments would be split up and scattered over the western frontier. Their brief existence as actual units ended except on paper in the War Department. A company here, a company there, and the thrill of fighting a real war would fade, leaving only memories of the battles with Santa Ana's force. In the meantime, however, each of the regiments gave a ball for its officers and the ladies of St. Louis. A final fling before the deadening routine of the peacetime army fastened its grip again. As the regimental quartermaster, Hancock was responsible for getting all of the supplies ready to throw the party, so he and Henry Heath would make several trips into St. Louis to gather all the necessary equipment. Heath, however, found a St. Louis beauty on one of his trips and had to find ways to see her without Hancock because, as Heath said, I knew if Hancock accompanied me, my cake would be all dough. She would never look at me. After the festivities, Heath convinced the commander of the barracks to let the band and officers parade around the city of St. Louis and serenade the young ladies. They spent the better part of an evening doing this, and as they were about to head back to Jefferson Barracks, a local who had been walking with the group exclaimed that the most beautiful girl in the West had just returned from her trip in the East and that she needed to be serenaded. The group then headed to the young lady's home where they played some tunes for her. Her window shutter opened slightly and something white was thrown out. It was a white glove. It was given to Hancock. Her name was Almira Russell. There was no time for romance in Hancock's life at this point. The 6th Infantry was split up and Hancock's group went to Fort Crawford in Wisconsin, while Heath's group went to Fort Atkinson in Iowa. The two friends were only separated for a short while until Heath came down with a serious case of dysentery, which he had contracted in Mexico. The Virginian was sent to Fort Crawford where the medical facilities were better equipped to take care of him, but the doctors soon pronounced the young man's life nearly at an end and they sent him to Richmond to die. Since he was too weak to travel by himself, Hancock volunteered to accompany him home. As they traveled by steamer down the Mississippi River then up the Ohio, by the time they reached Cincinnati, Heath's condition had improved greatly. They stopped over in that city where Hancock took care of some business. A young lady had expected marriage and Hancock had to straighten out the situation. They came to an agreement that they would be lifelong friends, but nothing more. Hancock and Heath went to Cleveland then, where Heath had another setback. Hancock nursed his friend back to traveling ability, and the two set off for New York City. On May 10th, 1849, they went to the Astor Opera House. A riot erupted outside the theater where 22 people were killed. However, the two young soldiers were unharmed. After the harrowing escape, they decided to pay General Scott a visit. The two officers were invited to dinner with the general, where they had shad and potatoes. Scott bragged about the taters that he got from a friend who grew them in New Jersey. When the plates were set down in front of Hancock and Heath, Winfield took his fork and began mashing his taters. Scott was aghast. He exclaimed, My God, my young friend, do you mash your potatoes? You can't tell the taste of potato when it's mashed. Hancock replied, I like my potatoes mashed. The witty Heath watched how Scott ate his potatoes and imitated the old general, then said, Yes, general, I can't tell the taste of a potato when it's mashed. Hancock glared at the Virginian. When the two left the general's quarters, Hancock berated his friend and Heath laughed until he nearly cried. For the rest of his life, Heath never failed to tell the potato story on Hancock. The two messmates then traveled to Philadelphia, then to Washington, D.C., where the two split up. Heath going on to Richmond, feeling much better, and Hancock heading back to Fort Crawford. By the end of the year, regimental headquarters was placed back at St. Louis, so Hancock was able to visit the young lady who had thrown her glove from the window. It was Major General Don Carlos Buell who introduced the two. Almira was the blonde-haired daughter of Samuel Russell, a prominent merchant in St. Louis. Winfield wasted no time in wooing Almira. By January 1850, the two were married, with Buell, Orlando Wilcox, and Anderson D. Nelson being the groomsmen for Hancock. A St. Louis resident described Almira as such, a woman of fine physique and striking comeliness of face, an accomplished musician, sparkling conversation, read the gems of repartee, 
and bounteously endowed with a kind and generous nature, she was universally admired and beloved. By October 1850, the two saw the birth of their first child, a boy named Russell. The couple and their child moved to Jefferson Barracks, but found their quarters dilapidated, with no hinges or keys for the doors. Hancock reached out to the post commander, Braxton Bragg, to help with the situation, but Bragg informed Winfield that a major had occupied the residence previous to him, and if it was good enough for a major, it was good enough for a lieutenant. The two began a heated exchange of letters until General Clark stepped in and had the place fixed for the couple. As regimental quartermaster, Hancock languished as a stagnant lieutenant. He was excellent at his job. He was a master over army protocol and was very generous and kind to those who he worked with. On November 5, 1855, he was finally appointed to captain in the quartermaster's department. He accepted it because it was a promotion, but he wanted to perform military duties outside of being a quartermaster. In February 1856, the Hancocks were ordered to Florida at Fort Myers. He and his family traveled there not knowing that hostilities were about to begin with the Seminoles. This would be the third attempt to subdue and remove the Seminoles from their homes in Florida. Previous to this, Hancock was a quartermaster for a garrison in an easily accessible landscape. However, now he had to supply the army within a swampy and inaccessible area. But the captain performed his duties superbly, with his superiors giving him great compliments for his work. Because of the hostilities, the family was unable to venture out of the garrison. Hancock attempted to get a milk cow to his quarters by ship from Tampa four times before the cow survived the journey. Almira and Russell did get to travel upriver on a boat, but had to lie in the bottom of the boat with a heavy rubber blanket covering them every time an Indian was spotted on shore. The situation was especially hard on Almira. She was the only woman at Fort Myers, but she made the best of the situation. Orlando Wilcox commented on Hancock's home by saying it was a perfect oasis in the desert to the rest of us, and the liberal hospitality and genial cordiality of Captain and Miss Hancock shed a glow of sunshine over our precious visits. On February 24, 1857, the Hancock's second child was born, a girl named Ada. She was the first white child known to be born in Fort Myers. After a little over a year in Florida, Hancock was sent to Fort Leavenworth to oversee quartermaster duties related to the situation known as Bleeding Kansas. By mid-May 1858, he was responsible for outfitting an expedition destined for Utah led by Albert Sidney Johnston to subdue the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were refusing to recognize the governor sent by President James Buchanan. He assembled a train of 128 wagons, five ambulances, and a thousand mules for the expedition, and accompanied it. However, by the time Hancock and the rest of the troops made it to Salt Lake City on June 26, 1858, a peaceful settlement had already been reached. Hancock was then ordered to Fort Bridger in the southwest corner of what is now Wyoming. When he arrived, he found the 6th Regiment unified and ordered to California. Hancock worked diligently to assemble all the necessary supplies for the expedition to California. They began their journey on August 21st and arrived at a town a little northeast of San Francisco on November 15th, having traveled 1,119 miles. Hancock soon took a leave of absence to escort his family to California, but Almira was hesitant. It was Colonel Robert E. Lee who took her aside and explained that it could be fatal to a young couple's happiness to live apart. She took his advice and agreed to make the trip. They first visited Washington, D.C. and intermingled with the town's socialites. The Democratic Party being in power, Hancock was right at home politically, as he mingled with Senator Jefferson Davis and Colonel Joseph E. Johnston. On April 4, 1859, the Hancocks left for their trip to California. The trip was a nightmare. They were packed on an overcrowded steamer and went to the Isthmus of Panama, where they disembarked and waited in 100 degree heat for 14 hours without water, hearing rumors that marauders had massacred the last steamer that had traveled through the isthmus. Once on the Pacific side, they sailed on the ship, the Golden Gate, also overcrowded. A group of men began harassing young Russell, resulting in Winfield getting into a fist fight and whipping them with his bare hands and threatening to kill anyone who came close to his family. The rest of the trip was comparatively calm. They arrived in San Francisco on May 23rd, then orders reached him that he was to go to Los Angeles. They boarded a steamer that afternoon. He was now Chief Quartermaster of the Southern District of California, headquartered at Los Angeles. Thank you all so much for watching. Please stay tuned for Part 4 coming up next week, and I'll see you next time. 
historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, reads the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian